Okay, well, thank you, everyone. Uh, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Appreciate uh, all the participation here. We um, have an hour booked for this discussion. We've got a lot of, of folks. I'm, I'm looking at the, the we've smiling faces here that have worked with in different contexts, different perspectives in the industry, um, uh, and some, some really cool projects as well. So I'm looking forward to this discussion. Um, we're we're going to keep it pretty free flowing and and um, just kind of roll with the topics. Um, we obviously wanted to to focus on you know Firefly a bit and multi party systems and 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 why we we think this could be really interesting and, and get your guys's input on on that. Um, uh, and uh, Sophia is going to join back as. In, in a second as well, and she's participating. I, I'm going to be the moderator on on this session. I think before we jump in, if we could just uh, give everyone like a 20 second intro, just to introduce yourself, and I'll I'll do the roll call. Uh, starting with you, Tony. All right, we're one for one on the mute button so far. <laughs> It is a little hard. To, it is a little hard to find on the the Hopin platform. We'll go to John and we'll come back to Tony in a sec. Um, great, uh, John Lebrie. I'm the um, CTO of uh, Greenfence, uh, and uh, uh, that that Greenfence has two sort of uh, business verticals, if you will. One is uh, consumer uh, side. Um, which is coupons, rebates, and collectibles um, in conjunction with retailers and the supply chain side, which is uh, centered around food safety. And we've been a user of um, Colado technology for, gosh, a couple of years now. I don't, I think it's a couple of years at least. Maybe you guys can tell me better. Um, and yeah, super enthusiastic to, um, super excited to, um, to discuss, you know, the impact of the release of the suite of tools. Yeah, and so John wears those dual hats of more of the B two B side of things, uh, as well as the digital assets uh, tokens platform. So really broad perspective. Uh, Tony, you ready to go? You're still on mute, Tony. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll, <laughs> we'll give you uh, another minute, uh, Gary. My uh, mouse there. Yeah. So uh, yeah, uh, I uh, worked with a few of you characters uh, in various capacities uh, over the years. Uh, currently, I, uh, I actually currently work for for Google. Not not related to blockchain, but uh, you know where uh, Google allows you to uh, work on the uh, open source stuff, especially if it's Apache uh, licensed. Uh, so yeah, I was uh, been a maintainer and contributor for Hyperledger Fabric on Hyperledger TSC. Ran blockchain at, at IBM for a bit. And uh, yeah, excited about uh, Firefly. I was one of the sponsors, as you guys know, for uh, for bringing it into Hyperledger. So glad to be here. Great, uh, Peter. Thanks, Steve. So uh, I'm the head of engineering um, at Collido, um, uh, and and at Collido we've we've been focused on making um, all of this blockchain tech consumable for enterprise throughout our our journey. Me personally, as an engineer, uh, I've lived pretty much. All of the, the trains of multi-party system integration that came before blockchain, messaging integration, so they cut my teeth back on um, IBM MQ or MQ series back in the in the day. So I've I've seen that seen things happen multiple times in this space, and I'm really excited that the the nascent potential of, of of blockchain to really accelerate what ecosystem building can be. Is is really 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 possible now, and really hoping that Firefly can be the project that brings us together to to bring it to a much wider audience. Like 100x the projects happening every year um, is the is, is the hope that we can we can do with this. Uh, Guillaume. Uh, so I'm Guillaume. I'm the founder at Atato. So uh, we are a team uh, based in Southeast Asia. Um, users of Kadeo, like John. And um, we are basically building blockchain platforms for banks and financial institutions uh, in the region. 
And uh, yeah, super excited to join uh, this uh, very impressive panel. All right, thanks, Guillaume. Uh, Brian. I'm Brian Bellendorf. I'm executive director of Hyperledger. I uh, am just really excited to see the project come in and want to support this and the growing community in any way that I can. Thank you. Sophia. Thanks, Steve. Um, yeah, this is actually I'm one of the founders, co founders of Clido, and this panel's great. I'm just looking at all the faces. Gary, um, we had the privilege to work together, and that was um, it's really great to see you again and reconnect. I know Guillaume and John have been, we've been working with you guys for almost, I think, three years now. And you actually interacted quite a bit with some of our open source components of like ETHConnect that are now part of Firefly. John, I, you know, your team launched NFTs three years ago when no one knew what NFTs were, but you were working with all the biggest T-Mobile, Kroger, Sony Fox, Heineken, and others. Um, and then Tony, uh, Tony leads a team that's one of the most sophisticated approaches we've seen in the industry for working through use cases, bringing clients together into building the consortiums um, and the product management discipline and professionalism there, and just mapping that now to building decentralized ecosystems. I think there's a lot of insight there. And, and of course, Brian, you know, it feels like coming home, um, coming back to Hyperledger um, since you know we were there at the the start when Hy you know Hyperledger was first formed and you came on board and we always loved your vision and love to see and how it's grown and developed over the years. So, welcome everyone. I'm happy to be here on the panel with you guys. Tony, I, over to you. I don't see a mute button anymore. That's yeah. I'm I, I'm hopeful. I had to play with my settings on my Chrome browser, and now actually it's it's piping audio. So this is great. Uh, I'm so excited to be on the panel. Uh, Tony Sanzo, head of product operations. Um, you know, my role is uh, is helping uh, 30 of the largest insurance companies in the U.S. to uh, develop uh, shared applications in the insurance and risk management space. So really excited to be here to speak to y'all. Cool. Well, just, let's jump in on right there, Tony. Um, you know, you're talking about the shared applications. Maybe you could start it with, with uh, a couple thoughts on on you know just what's different about these decentralized applications mm -hmm. than you know the other stuff that we've been doing and we continue to do. What 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 makes these particularly uh, difficult? Sure. So um, I guess for me, it's kind of a, or for Ristream, I guess it, it's a double whammy because not only are our um, applications decentralized, our design process is decentralized as well. So in order to, to design a, an application, we, we bring together and we create a working group with um, five, 10, 15 different companies, all with different motives and different um, challenges that they're trying to accomplish as part of a shared business process. So, um, you know, what makes this kind of different is that instead of, you know, an AIG or instead of a USAA or instead of a, a company trying to uh, put together a core system or something that uh, a technology product that they're trying to put in place to solve one problem just for themselves, they need to be able to solve that problem collaboratively with everybody else. And everybody on the network needs to get some sort of value out of that, you know, achieving mm -hmm. that problem. You can't kind of uh, disenfranchise or, or um, you know, uh, make make the value less for a particular participant, because everybody kind of needs to to kind of work together to accomplish the same goal. Yeah. So you've got we sort of split it the, the problem in half. You've got the business side of the problem and then the technical side. Gary, jump jumping into the technical side of you know these decentralized applications. What, what's your perspective on, on what's really challenging and hard about them? Yeah, I, I think, uh, well, you know, one of the things with uh, on, the, on the business side, right, which was, you know, we used to have a long time ago, like internal processes, right? And there was like architectures like, of, uh, you know, message brokers, message buses, service oriented architecture, right? How do we make everything loosely coupled, et cetera, sort of inside the enterprise, maybe even add, you know, processes on top of that. And, you know, and then there, there, there was some, Ability to move data in and out, you know, uh, EDI, VANs, uh, you know, sort of B2B stuff, right? But as the world's kind of gone on now, right, we actually now need to take those workflow and data systems, and they're now, now not just part of your company, but they, they have to involve all of those parties, right? 
Um, and, and I think for a while there really weren't good ways of making sure that we could have, you know, the right, so, the right consensus protocols, for example, right, for sharing right across this data, right? And uh, especially when you trust but don't trust, right? You know, trust but verify, you know, if you will, uh, sort of mechanism, right? So I think that's been, you know, some of the important factors there. And then those protocols have come around. They're really kind of in the blockchain layer, right? There's several frameworks out there. You, you mentioned them earlier, um, you know, for doing that. And then I think the next difficulty on top of that is, well, okay, now I've got this sort of layer that handles the transaction, some of the business logic and rules and execution, but how do I actually like build applications that orchestrate that stuff, right? Because everybody, again, is still used to just building like my app that I share, you know, right? We've moved to a world where I have a web app and everybody uses that web app, right? But this is sort of different, right? It's like, I need to have my version of it or, or your stuff, right? It's more of that interaction, like workflow type, type applications, right? So we, we got as far as the plumbing layer, I think, but then the next layer up to really make this take off to match all the stuff that, uh, you know, sort of Tony was talking about is to have this kind of orchestration layer that spans enterprises and can leverage blockchain technology. So that, that, that had been the gap, I think, up until, you, you know, now, hopefully. <laughs> If, if, if that's the, the logical path, Sophia, what, what are, tell us some of the horror stories <laughs> for, for the path. What, what, what's that look like in, in practice? Well, I mean, I guess <clears throat> we touched upon this in the, the, over, the opening keynote, but in, in the past years, um, you know, if you go back to 2015, 2016, the first real enterprise projects were starting. Um, people thought, you know, they're building blockchain and it's writing smart contracts, putting everything on the chain. And then when they start actually building the projects out, they realize, you know, five to 10% of what they're doing is really running the nodes and it's all this off chain components. So that decentralized off chain tech that, that was new and emerging that they needed to learn and get to use. And often a lot of commodity tech, like some of the stuff Gary was talking about, just building a whole solution around it. So it ended up taking, you know, a lot, a lot more time. You know, they thought it'd be a couple, you know, number of months. It ended up being a number of years. Maybe they never even got into production, spent tens of millions of dollars, a lot of custom consulting, because there was no real open source project that tackled th those sorts of plumbing layers for them. So each time was being rebuilt. Um, so I th think one of the things we were excited from the early days is how can we really accelerate the adoption of this tech, you know, make um, sort of the plumbing the easy part, people can focus on the business application logic, business value, doing the, the hard work like Tony's doing around bringing stakeholders together in the insurance industry, John's doing that in media and entertainment and retail and supply chain spaces. So, you know, I think that's where the industry has been. There are clients who shifted to this new approach. So we wanted to open this up and have everyone in the industry be able to join the community, contribute and benefit as well. Ryan, from, from your perspective, you know, how, how, has, how have you seen Hyperledger projects helping with some of those problems? And, and, and where, where do you think are sort of, do you come up against the wall and, you know, is there an opportunity for an, another generation or another wave of, of projects to come and help maybe in some of those areas? Oh, sure. I mean, uh, <clears throat> you, you often see conversation on the different uh, mailing lists and in, in, uh, in chat and that sort of thing where people are asking questions that aren't really specifically like, like I think I found a bug or I think there's a, a question with a specific feature, but really questions about how to do design um, for distributed applications. And this realization um, that everyone seems to independently make once they get in, uh, but really should be more front center, which is um, that blockchains are not a big data tool. Everyone is so wired around big data and machine learning models and you know that they're like, this must just be like a gigantic enterprise service bus, right? You know, I just want to throw everything into it. Um, but really, it's more of a small batch artisanal data tool, right? Um, and and that you really want to use it as sparingly as as possible, but still, you know, encode some some important logic in in the smart contracts when 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 that's appropriate. Um, and that leads to to something that's both like a technical uh, design uh, kind of thing, and, and that's where people need help understanding it, but also somewhat of a social design too. And it reminds me even of like 
22 years ago, uh, Hewlett Packard released this like R&D project out as an open source thing to try to get uh, folks interested in called eSpeak, which is like pre-web services even, right? Um, pre, uh, uh, They were like, you know, this is how you wire up um, the ERP systems of the world into, to, you know, one big automated flow. And their examples, you know, were just like the worst. They were things like, well, let's imagine you're the shoe industry. And this is how you would use this software if you were the shoe industry. Well, no one person is the shoe industry, right? Everyone has their roles to play. And so um, figuring out how to do design of even these, these individual blockchain networks that you build is necessarily a collaborative process. It necessarily means talking with people outside your organization. That's the kind of thing that open source projects, when they're done right, know how to do. And so there's a lot of resonance here between those two. And I think the more that we can um, try to help people understand how to how to do those kinds of collaborative, you know, communication and design processes, uh, uh, the the better off even the individual uh, blockchain projects built using these tools will be. How 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 about you? How have you seen sort of customers and some of these larger projects um, overcoming some of the unforeseen technology obstacles that that present themselves when they're trying to do something decentralized for the first time? Yeah, I, I, I guess um, for me, from what I've seen, the things that matter most are the poor developers who aren't the specialists. The, what you've got is um, usually there's some kind of network operator. Um, maybe it's the, you know, the best people who know blockchain phone into a mix from a whole bunch of companies. Maybe it's a separate business entity that's been created. And they're kind of the only people in the whole organization or the whole of the, of the network that kind of understand blockchain at its core. And then what you've actually got are a whole bunch of business people trying to use the next generation of the way that they're, they're going to solve a really hard problem that's taking them weeks and they want it to take minutes. Um, you've got web developers trying to build great user experience. To, to show how these business people can do something better because of blockchain and trying really hard for it not to look like the really ugly, slow, multiple second per transaction mess that they've seen else, else, elsewhere in, in the blockchain space and have something that's great, feels good, responsive. And, and, then, um, and then you've got, and I guess I, I care a lot about these, these guys because I've worked with them for so long, you've got the enterprise integration people inside of the organizations that look after the core data systems and the on-ramps and the offense of the data. And no one ever gets past, um, no one can ever get to shadow production or even, and definitely not past shadow production without integrating those core systems. And so you've got like, you know, in, networks with 10, 20, 30 large organizations, that's 10, 20, 30 integration teams that need to know how to connect in. So it really matters how easy it is for non-blockchain tech people to, to be able to get data in, be able to get data out. And it really matters that the system behaves normally, doesn't behave in some crazy, strange way. And, and, and we've been on a journey like with the technology that we've been building, trying to help with eConnect and other bits to try and just make blockchain feel like a technology that makes sense to, you know, mortal engineers like me who just come from a world where stuff, what makes sense is well established. I'm, 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 when, when thinking about someone who's dealt with large organizations that may or may not care that blockchain is actually part of the solution. Um, <laughs> and I see you on the screen, I, I certainly, um, you know, some ideas come to mind there. I mean, how, how, how have you how have you dealt with you know some of these these larger initiatives and projects over the years, um, and and maintaining that balance uh, in, in customer interest, but but trying to maintain the velocity of, of what you what you're doing. Yeah, it's a great question. I, I think speaking a bit to what Peter was just saying, I think one of the um, areas in which we can do better is um, to to do a little bit better in terms of education and 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 helping in the sort of cultural discussions that surround blockchain technology. Right? Um, there's these natural tensions that exist um, it, when we're trying to build a consortium, for example. Um, if you're trying to find four or five or six or ten organizations that would naturally want to collaborate together on a, a source of shared truth, then um, generally you would 
uh, you would you'd find you'd find that organizations that generally were uh, attracted to collaborating in general would, would be the best candidates, but those aren't necessarily the best candidates to operate a, a shared of source truth, a, a shared source of truth, right? You, you actually want competitors um, it, to be in to be in that space because they are the narrative that you can tell around that to the rest of the world is that these people wouldn't aren't naturally inclined to collude. So you've got that challenge, right? This natural tension. Um, between best people would be collaborators, the best to, to, to actually share data, the best people to actually operate a shared data system are not collaborators at all. Um, so we have to tell that story, I think, a little bit better. It's certainly something that we've um, struggled with. The next is, besides the sort of technical practitioners that are right in the space, as you were saying, Peter, nobody else really understands the technology. Not really. I mean, I, I, I go from day to day or week to week with somebody coming in trying to pitch me a better blockchain based solution um, and, and the way that they position themselves against the solutions that we're already using is almost always demonstrates that they don't really understand the state of the art in the space at all. Right. And you almost want to sit them down and say, okay, so let's talk about blockchain technology, right. Versus a mom and a dad and they love each other and they get together and it's just really super simple version B stuff that you have to sort of do. Right. Um, and then of course, everybody's in production, right? There are legacy systems and nobody really wants you to disrupt um, a legacy system in order to demonstrate that you're gonna add value to their operations. Um, unless, of course, you're gonna replace everything because everybody hates their legacy system, right? So they'd love for somebody to come in and say, you know, actually tomorrow when you come in, it's all gonna be different and it's all gonna work better. Um, that's sort of naturally in um, a sort of balance. The challenge there is that I think the most successful way to, to actually introduce this technology is to choose one thing, right? One pain point, um, roll in, solve that problem, um, not change everything, not, not replace everything in the system, but identify one specific pain point and work on that. And then you can sort of, you know, slide the rest of the stuff in as and when people actually acknowledge that you're adding value um, and that it makes sense for more and more of their production to move into the system or, you know, the ecosystem that you created. What's exciting to me about Firefly, um, if I could jump into that really briefly, is that you know I, I'm, I've been, I, I started out as a miner in the ecosystem. I've been a, a, an Ethereum fan forever, and I see what's happened in decentralized finance there, um, specifically with the composability of you know smart contract development across that ecosystem. And so as these pieces become available, people do crazy, you know, unimaginable stuff with it, right? If you were talking about uh, smart contracts in 2017, if you were looking for an example, everybody would say escrow, right? An escrow contract. Today, what you can do with Maker and Alchemy and Curve, and I mean, you, you can you can layer seven things together to achieve, you know, crazy returns uh, on tokenized value that nobody could have imagined or even described three years ago. And I, so I, I think that, you know, as me as a technical practitioner, and I'm sorry if I'm talking too much here, you know, the first thing I do when I try and solve a problem is I say, what's out there? Like, what, what do I not have to build because it already exists, right? Um, and, I, and I immediately go to the open source community. That's what I've done since the late 80s, right? Like, I'm sure there are smarter people than me that have already either faced these problems and, and come up with uh, specific approaches. So the availability of something like this, even three years ago would have been like, oh, this is great. I don't have to solve any of these issues, any of these technical issues. I can work on the things that are harder, like, the, like education, like, um, uh, convincing people that, you know, this actually makes sense for a specific, you know, pain point inside of the organization. And now I'm going to be quiet. <laughs> Thanks, John. Uh, Guillaume, what, what's your perspective on, on some of the, the topics that, that we've been discussing here? Um, you know, may, maybe the mix, or, or how, how big is the, the integration to the back office system? How, how big of a, no. a piece is that in the puzzle? And What's your sense for the mix of, of effort that you apply to a project, sort of a, from the business use case down through the plumbing? Yeah, so yeah, happy to share. And uh, you know, we're we're working typically with banks or other financial institutions. So, like John is saying, they're in production. They have systems. They're already running. So, uh, I guess a big part of the the challenge then is in on the integration with those systems. And um, you know, when I when we look on at that side at the state of blockchain today, you know, we, we have Ethereum, like like we were discussing, you know, it's an amazing tool, it's an amazing machine, but really at its core, Ethereum is just like a secure share CPU and that's it. And, and you have no IO, you have no OS, you have no networking, you have nothing else. And so 
when you think about it, you know, tools like Firefly and the, the infrastructure that uh, Kaleido is building, we see it kind of like an operating system. You know, uh, we're we still in the early stages, so maybe it's the DOS of, uh, you know, those new types of computers that we call blockchains, right? Uh, and so with DOS, you can do I.O., you can do, uh, uh, you know, some uh, management features, you can do some kind of utility function that you must build when then you want to develop applications on top of it. And so, you know, nobody today would go and say, uh, I'm, I'm going to build a new application. Let's start by writing an operating system. Doesn't make any sense. Uh, and so with blockchain, three years ago, we had to write our own operating systems to do things like I.O. and, you know, basic functions of using this shared computer. And I think that now that we have companies like Kaleido that are building those operating systems, uh, we can really go much faster, you know. Uh, companies do not have to reinvent the wheel, like John is saying, and we can turn to open source tools like Firefly. And so, you know, I think it's so complex that it's natural that it's taken a few years for the community to realize what shape uh, a blockchain operating system has, you know, and what functions we want from it. But uh, to me, Firefly, it's kind of uh, that step along the way, you know, it's, uh, we start to have a better vision of what it takes to do I.O. on blockchain and what's kind of the the core function of a blockchain operating system. So, yeah, I'm super excited for it. Yeah, that's great. Well, to, to Sophia and Peter, you know, the, just building on Guillaume's metaphor of kind of the, the computer there, why, why, why was, and, and we had talked earlier in the day about, you know, how Kaleido had sort of organically built this, this IP over time, but now, you know, we, we feel like Hyperledger like is the right place for for this sort of a system maybe maybe uh, maybe try to give some color to that or around what what's the thinking there and what's the opportunity for for a larger system like this and why why should it be done in the open maybe i'll start and, and sophia you can go um after i um i i think we've learned what success looks like we, we've we've fished enough people out the soup um, with tech to to know kind of um, the what's needed. Um, but I think the problem, you know, if if body body systems are going to be a thing, the scale is big. You know, for AI to be a thing, the scale is big. And and I believe as a, as a developer and as an engineer, because it's the only way I build anything, that the only way that that kind of scale of change happens is through open source nowadays. It just, just is. Um, and while we know um, for Hyperledger, we're potentially like up a layer from where Hyperledger has been, we also see the diversity inside of Hyperledger, which is fantastic, the diversity of people, of backgrounds, particularly with Besu um, having come, come in, um, that, that, there's, that there really is the community to come together um, to solve the hard, the hard problems. So it's really, really exciting for us, and it's new for us to be part of something that um, could only could only be successful by being collaborative and being big in a way that open source can do that and you know don't want to have a too grander thought but we we do think that like um blockchain tech and multi-body systems needs done for it what kubernetes did for docker right and we don't know what piece of the puzzle firefly fits into but we know we want to be a part of that community that's trying to do that same that same thing, um, and and it's really exciting that that maybe that can be a, a lockstep to allow multi party systems to achieve that next stage of growth that that we all want them to. Sophia, you have anything? Yeah. To add on that? Well, I yeah. think just a little hopping on to what Pete, the back of what Peter said. I mean, I think Hyperledger has the the, the enterprise blockchain sort of open source communities center gravity is in Hyperledger, so it seemed like a natural place. From, from the timing um, perspective, you know, I think if you look at other new emerging technologies like AI, you know, there were fits and starts for decades because it wasn't consumable. Even maybe I'm reflecting now, seven years ago, eight years ago, you know, if you went to 
some large major IT vendors, I'm not going to name names, who had very prominent AI offerings, they were huge services engagements. It, you know, it wasn't really until there was a lot of sort of innovation in the startup side and then even the larger vendors moved to just the easy APIs, cloud-driven, that people could start sort of pulling AI into um, their solutions. So I think where block enterprise blockchain is, you know, we see, as John mentioned, DeFi really taking off. And I love, Guillaume, your analogies around the I.O. I mean, so the need for some basic functionality. If, if that doesn't appear in the community now, think just the adoption would stall under the weight of all these projects where people have spent a lot of money. And, um, you know, some are able to restart and do, you know, because there's so much business value and they've got the momentum. But it'd be a shame to sort of clip the wings of all this innovation that's needed as, you know, post-COVID, the world is looking to digitally transform a lot of back office processes. So I think there's sort of a perfect storm of forces where we can really help unleash the potential of this for the good, you know, of companies and governments. And it boils down to, you know, our healthcare experience of looking for a provider you know some of these things are even just public data but the way companies share them we can't find if a doctor's accepting new clients in network we can't you know get an appointment maybe the wrong phone number in there i mean there's just you, <laughs> basic problems that could be solved tony um i know you're one project you worked on and this was during you know covid in you know march and you look at what was happening in new york last year you know families were affected by someone who passed away what they didn't know if they had life insurance there's no coordination between all the parties there's no master death record in the us which can sound a little bit morbid but when you lose a loved one and now you need to get 15 paper copies of a certificate stamped and then take it to a bank take it to a funeral home you know spend out many hours with insurance companies you know it's great to see companies want like the carriers want to solve that problem and i and tony you worked with them on that um so we want the technology to be there for them in a form where they can really move fast and, and get to those outcomes to help people tony you want to add anything to that sure it's it, it's actually kind of interesting because it's it's double-edged um, I, I think that, that the insurance companies want to do everything that they can to service their customers. So it's the ability to kind of bring together yeah. through all of those different disparate channels, the different stakeholders and the different information streams through the DLT to kind of make that possible, right? So that, you know, when, when somebody is deceased, you don't have to go to the bank and you, and you don't have to share that information with the 80 other parties that are necessary to actually, you know, bring somebody's final affairs into, into, into relief, into to make sure that you have the ability to, to uh, you know, redeem your life insurance policy, your annuity or, or what have you. But, but there's also an incentive based um, portion of it too. You know, in general, insurance companies are not incentivized to share um, information with other insurance companies. So, you know, one of the things that was great about that use case is the ability to actually build an infrastructure, whether it's a tokenized infrastructure or through some other incentives that, you know, one party sharing information with another um, creates value for both parties, um, and, and, and in, in the, the end, I guess, the customers made whole in doing that. Cool. Uh, Gary, go, going back maybe to a couple of uh, Peter's comments from, from a few minutes ago, and I, I know you had shared, you, you signed the, the proposal for this project, and, and when we talked with you about it, you said you had had similar observations, similar thoughts, so, um, you know, pull, pull back the curtain for us a little bit on on what's interesting to you about Firefly and, and how and, and maybe some predictions about how you think it's going to uh, shape up going forward or any thoughts on that front. Yeah, you know, I, I think, you know, looking looking back at a lot of the times when we saw people like in, in some of the solutions that people are building with like, you know, fabric, you know, for example. Right. But it, but it could have been, you know, any kind of blockchain. Right. And then and then sometimes even looking at like what people do with you know, Corda sometimes, especially, right, more like, because it was more like sort of like, you know, peer to peer, right? There, there was really this notion I saw where people, people really uh, conflated what I would call like workflow with like, like interactive workflow with actual like consensus protocols. They're not, they're not actually the same thing, right? Consensus protocols, like you and I coming, like people always have this as like as people coming to agreement, but that's not really it, right? And these things, these are like computerized algorithms that determine like, you know, agreement about a state, right? That are, you know, based on, you know, 
more or less a set of rules, but not, not, not opinions and tasks and flowing, right? And we used to, people used to show it in like fabric. They'd say like, you know, we have endorsements is how we did it, right? I'm getting endorsement from these people. That wasn't really the same thing as like approval, right? Endorsement was just checking at the state that the thing executed correctly according to a set of rules, but it's not really, not everything can be like an automated stamp approval, right? There's like some stuff that are just, you know, approvals or have to talk to other systems. And when you start looking at that, 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 that brings the whole notion of, you know, workflow, really. I mean, for lack of a better term, right, I'll call it, you know, workflow distributed systems, but, you know, it really was across multiple parties, right? And if you look at most workflow stuff, right, they're built for the intra company use case. Um, and if you, if you take another step back, right, B2B systems, B2B ecosystems, right, had sharing of data, right? So you, if you kind of break it down, right, the only things that really share data per se, right, I mean, I mean you know, there, there are people who do, don't get me wrong, but B2B has always been big on this, right? You share EDI records and whatever, supply chain, et cetera, but it's data, right? I have my system, you have your system. We just agree that we're using, you know, this X.12 or this EDI format or whatever, right? Healthcare, the same thing with HL7 or whatever. The systems are still completely different. You could be Epic, you could be Cerner, but HL7 was flying around and we think that solved data, you know, integration problems, right? It didn't, right? So you, then you had blockchain, which allowed us to put the rules around that and give me a shared view of the data, right? That's cool. And synchronized and things like that. But it doesn't let me mimic the actual process of like the, the activities that actually happen in, in, in a step-by-step -step kind of process that aren't consensus protocol driven, right? And I think that's what, you know, we were looking at, right? And this allows you to break things down, whether there's 50 people involved or three people involved, right? Or you could have an ecosystem of 50 people and sometimes there's only three parties involved, right? In something, but they wanted the whole aggregate is actually performing the sort of blockchain -y pieces, right? For verification, et cetera but the interaction and data movement was there. And we've tried to like overlay all of that stuff in fabric. We tried to do it with like private data. I know even like in the Ethereum stuff, they try to do this with, it's, it's, a, it's a force fit, right? Of something that's not, that's not the right way to solve that particular problem. So I, I think that's been the missing element, right? And then I think if you can model, so if you want to solve problems sort of the, answer a different question, but that was asked before, right? I think there's two, two ways to advance this stuff because you can solve problems if you can prove that you can have the process flow work, and then we can hook in the underpinnings. Instead of trying to build it from the bottom up, we can actually prove out that I can send stuff around to Tony and we can agree on the process and we can show stuff flowing. I am sure that we can find some plumbing, right, in today's stuff that can make the blockchain -y pieces happen or, or not. It could be a centralized database if that's acceptable for some people, right? Or it could be blockchain, you know, if it's not. So I think that's the piece that's been missing. And that's, that was the part that I liked about Firefly, right? Um, I like the term, I'm not a buzzwordy person, but I think, you know, multi-party systems is a better term for what we're trying to do than calling them like, than calling it like enterprise blockchain for sure. Um, because that's just too, you know, broad of a term. And, uh, and, and I guess the last thing I'd say is if you give people tooling that allows them to be a bit above the tech, Right. It's just going to make it easier for them to get started and maybe apply this stuff. And, and, and I'd say one thing that slows things down is that people create architectures like people have a queue of problems to solve. So I'm not a big fan of enterprise architecture. I should put that out there. Right. I think there's, that's why enterprises are too slow. They make decisions three years in the past on what their architecture is going to be. Right. So if you really want to have it, you have to say, here's the problem I need to solve. And now let me go find the, the, is there a technology today? If I was making the decision today on how to solve this problem, would it be the same way that I saw would have, that I made when I made my decision three years ago, right? And I think that blockchain becomes more palatable if people can actually like use it and get, get above the bits and bytes, right? And multi-party systems matches that much better than having, I don't mean this in a pejorative way, but stupid arguments about my consensus protocols better than yours that doesn't solve an actual business problem. Okay, I'm done now. <laughs> Brian, you remember the good old days when we had 
when there are all those arguments about consensus algorithms and which ones are better? <laughs> um, I, I don't I so much remember arguments about consensus mechanisms at a low level. Maybe that happened like before even Fabric was released or something like that. Um, I, I, I think what ha ended up doing was we were conflating small early architectural decisions that you always have to make when you start a software project because you have to start somewhere I, I, with longer term, like big picture, like that shall be the only way to do it, right? Um, and so, so I, I'm I'm actually really happy to, for us to see optionality at lots of different layers, um, but but with an, a common enough backbone to bring these different pieces together. And so that hopefully is what Firefly represents. I mean, it's it's somewhat similar to the way that in in the Linux operating system, there's always been debates about different ways of doing things, and if you can, you know, all the way up to like what windowing environment to use, and and really if we can engineer for optionality at these different layers, it's why the focus on pluggability in Firefly is so cool, um, <clears throat> then we can have the best of both worlds. We can try the different approaches and, and for use case, figure out the right ones to pick. So um, really happy to see that. And I think that the more that people in the rest of the Hyperledger community understand that, they'll find ways to slot in the things that they've been building. Guillaume, what's, what's your perspective on, on if how much value or is this a game changing notion uh, for the sorts of projects that you've seen uh, either the, the multi-party system concept overall, or you know something like what Gary was saying a minute ago, with you know being being able to untangle you know process, you know business process from you know consensus and, and, and so contract distribution and so on. On um, you know coming from our clients are banks, financial institution, brokers, so. For them, it's a mix of, on one side, you know, they want to do DeFi, they want to get licenses to open a, an exchange, uh, get a broker business going for crypto, for example. And then on the other side, they've got all those problems of data exchange and, you know, they're building consortium and they want to have private chains to do certain workflows. And so from our perspective, then the, the complexity is, okay, there's these various technologies, some is Fabric, some is Besu, some is Corum, some is public network. Some that we're building now are going to be like layer two Ethereum solution. So the complexity is that, you know, from an engineering perspective, then we have to get quite far into the understanding of the underlying technology. And, you know, sometimes one is better than the other, uh, but it's kind of like, you know, digging into what's the difference between an AMD CPU and an Intel CPU. We, we do it because we have to today, but we don't really want to. And so having some abstraction layer which gives us a standard interface to interact with one blockchain or more blockchains, uh, I think is, yeah, it's extremely important. And so for me, it's, yeah, it's a game changer, like you said, to have this kind of early version of a standard interface to work with a blockchain so that uh, more effort, more energy uh, can go on the, actually building the application, you know, and, and it brings something useful for, for the business. So, yeah, I'm sure. In five years, we're going to look back and, and think that was an important moment. Yeah. John, what what about a, like a digital assets or a, a token perspective? I, I know a, a lot of your your focus is 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 really around taking that particular powerful construct that blockchain brings along and trying to you know plumb that through an ecosystem. Um, you know how. How, how challenging is it to really build collaborative apps with the token for a set of enterprises these days? And, and how, how much efficiency could, if, if we envisioned a, 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 a more purpose-built system, could, could we bring to bear there? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Uh, when you say token, I, I have a little allergic reaction right now. I, I think as you said earlier, Sophia, uh, you know, we've been, we, we started doing coupons and rebates using NFTs, literally ERC 721 NFTs two or three years ago now. And of course, now all the phone calls we made over those last two or three years to people saying, you know, you really should start paying attention to this technology. Everybody picked up the phone and said, I want to issue an NFT, to which we generally say, why? I mean, what, what, why do you need to issue, you know, an NFT, you know, from, from the space station or, you know, whatever, whatever current example uh, is 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 dropping across our thing. Uh, it, tokenization is extremely powerful. We see it generally. Um, we see tokens as a great way to incentivize behavior, right? So coupons a great example of you know a, 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 a discrete fixed 
digital object that can be used by a brand to incentivize behavior in a customer, or at the other end of um, the farm to fork chain could be used to in a third world country to share data about the conditions um, uh, that he finds locally in um, his working area. So um, we think that that stuff like that, tokenization like that to encourage uh, data sharing or sustainability is really important. Um, you quickly run into the problem, which I kind of was talking about earlier in terms of narrative, <clears throat> which is what um, I call the says who problem right now, right? Which is, okay, so you, I've given you a token. Well, who, who's, who says you have that token? Right, like who's responsible for operating the nodes? So who, who's the person that makes sure that those tokens don't actually flow freely from you know one entity to another? Um, that they act, that if there's value, if if a major brand deposits a hundred thousand dollars worth of value into one end of the ecosystem, that that is uh, you know husbanded, shepherded in the correct way to make sure that you know if we're doing instantaneous settlement that stuff isn't leaking out on the edges, either because you've written a bad smart contract or because you've got people in the ecosystem that are colluding. I don't have any good answers for how to fix this. I, I just know that these are the these are the narratives that we're constructing now as we talk to potential partners and, and are trying to encourage people to operate nodes. Like we want you to be responsible for making sure that as we have tokenized value flowing through our system to incentivize behaviors and to do instantaneous settlement, that you're a responsible shepherd. Right? That's the hardest part. Yeah. Uh, Tony, uh, just thinking about how Firefly setting out to achieve this higher level of, of abstraction, right? right. The, you guys with, with Riskstream, you've been thinking about really building an industry platform. Yep. Right. You've been on this journey. What 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 does it mean for for you building a, a platform that ambitious to take a bunch of the plumbing problem <laughs> off of the table for you to focus maybe focus on some some other things and the second part of the question is on, on maybe the multi-protocol side, how do you think about different protocols and how valuable would you know having some amount of flexibility be there with maybe a, a common API sitting on top of it? Uh, great question, Steve. Um, I can say that our relationship with Kaleido and, and, and now with the, the, the Firefly platform has been kind of a game, a game changer for, for Restream. Uh, we were able to do in six months, but it took us kind of two years to do through other methods, through consulting and kind of building things in a custom way. And I think that one of the things that we're finding over and over again is not only is that speed to market really important for us as, you know, the, the cycle for insurance companies is, is a little bit different or maybe a little bit different than in other areas where there's this underlying mistrust of anything new and then all of a sudden they kind of see it and it works and it's like all right we want it now um so that allows us to, to kind of move at a uh, maybe not a a slow and steady pace but we, we can kind of move in, in in kind of leaps and bounds when it comes to that and you know given the fact that you know um in the insurance industry since that since technology is a, a bit of a, a dirty word but but a word that's necessary um, you know, having the ability to kind of do things through the the, the, flat, the Firefly platform and kind of using that to build what we're building with, with Canopy, um, it allows us to actually focus, as you said, on the business problem. And, you know, where blockchain developers are kind of uh, a scarce resources or scarce resource with many of the custo or customers that we deal with, um, you know, being able to kind of use resources that one would use to develop any other uh, technology or any other application and kind of leverage the APIs that you guys have put out there makes the whole blockchain process a heck of a lot more accessible to our members than it traditionally would have been, you know, before. Um, I know that there was a second part to that question. <laughs> I'm trying to remember what it was. Protocol. Uh, Multi-protocol, multi yes. Yeah. So, you know, one of the things that's, that's really interesting and, and certainly being a not-for-profit, it's one of the challenges that we face is that, you know, we always have to make critical decisions on, you know, where we spend our time, where we spend our money, and, and what protocol or what um, technology is fit for purpose to do that. Um, and the fact that, you know, we wouldn't have to start from the ground up if say Hyperledger was better suited for one uh, application or Corda or Quorum or, or what have you. Um, the fact that we have one kind of central clearinghouse to build a set of business rules and a set of capabilities on, and then we can be um, thoughtful about how we apply those sets of business processes and capabilities against the underlying ledger makes 
you know, our job so much easier because it, it gives us the flexibility to not let the technology drive the solution, so let the solution, the solution drive the technology. And Sophia, have, have, it, with some of your clients, have you seen you know, some of these big, bigger, more ambitious sort of industry-wide platforms, you know, just, just the size and the number of companies and number of participants, you know, running multiple blockchain technologies in parallel, right? Have, have you seen those sorts of things or have you had any uh, yeah. discussions there? <clears throat> I think people always would have wanted that, but now that it's available, certainly they see that as a big differentiator they could offer to their, the ecosystems they're putting together in their respective industry. So, you know, Tony's doing it for property casualty, life and annuity, reinsurance, and we have others in healthcare and other domains. Um, so, yeah, multi-protocol is really important to them. It's interesting, I, I, I think it gets to a comment earlier, a lot of times people focus too much on the tech decisions and I think something else Tony said just now was really interesting. They don't, they don't, when they see it, they want it. So we've seen a lot of that where people don't really understand, you know, Gary, to your point, enterprise blockchain versus multi-party system or what a decentralized app really entails. And sometimes we even hear, you know, they don't even care about the UI or app. They're just, you know, want, they just want to focus on the plumbing. But the minute they actually see it come to life, and they see it on the glass and it looks like a real, you know, real app, a real product, then all, you know, everyone wants to use it and what, you know, why aren't we in production yesterday and they, they want to onboard, you know, all their friends and family in the industry. And so it's just amazing seeing the acceleration that could happen when you actually get to where the people who, you know, they're operating huge sets of call centers in one use case that just, you know, calling on making sure the data is accurate. You know, they want to arm all these people, use this new app on the new, you know, multi-party system. But you need to get to that stage to then get the buy-in and acceleration. I think that you've seen Tony, we've seen that in other places too. So I think, you know, having Firefly is a step forward there. Um, what helps people get to those where they actually have the application and they could be you know, onboarding and getting, um, getting the real usage and scaling. Yeah. Okay. Well, final five minutes here. We're gonna, I'm going to switch to to going around the horn and giving everyone sort of their final thought or, or key takeaway um, uh, to, for for the audience here. And I'll uh, start with uh, Peter. I guess I'm going to just elaborate a little bit on the previous point. There were there were people building solutions for multi-party systems, and there were ecosystems. Um, I, I, they're, they're almost like islands, and um, at the moment they're kind of co-located, right? You build a solution within an ecosystem or for an ecosystem, and, and it's kind of locked there and it's stuck there. Um, you build for the mainnet, or you build for this particular private consortium. And the scale that we can get to is when we start to build bridges. And um, we've talked about interoperability between blockchains as one type of bridge. I think um, interoperability between development communities, um, it, the ability to build solutions that can be more of an app store model where your application can work in multiple communities, I think is a different way to scale um, this, this great fantastic that, that the blockchain has. And I think that's really exciting. Uh, Brian? Yeah, well, uh, you, you know, an observation from 25 years of this is that, uh, you know, building a successful open source project is a lot different from building a successful commercial product. Um, and and you have to think about them very differently. And that means, you know, kind of designing for, it, it, I know it's, it's, it's a trope, but designing for inclusion, designing for, uh, uh, you know, that, that first user experience and making sure as they're coming in and getting used to how to use the code, uh, you know, they're also simultaneously learning why the code is built the way that it was built. Um, and so having all the metadata involved in the development of that uh, 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 is so essential so that you don't get what are called bike shedding arguments. That's a, a fun thing to go look up and understand um, the history of that. Uh, and, and it really means designing for opening the lid underneath the software as well whereas a commercial product you you want to discourage them from doing that you want to kind of you know do the wizard of oz pay no attention to the man behind the, the curtain kind of thing um uh, and and then i also think that means answering you know the beginner questions pretty quickly or pointing to an faq answering the deeper questions very publicly even when they are kind of thorny um and then ha always having a parking place for new ideas about what what's next so that even if the team that's been on it 
you can't get to adding a certain feature or integrating with another ledger or others, there's always a place to direct people so that that, that energy you know, isn't dissipated because once dissipated, it's, it's hard to bring it back. So all these things are on my mind as I think about how to help the, the, the Firefly community become successful. Uh, uh, but also hopefully it's on uh, all of our mind as we're, as we're uh, deploying the project. Thank you. Uh, John, final thought, key takeaway. Um, yeah, I guess two real quick. I'll, I'll, I'll hit again on uh, two things I said earlier. First is I think that um, the quickest path to success is to pick a single problem, try and solve that first. Um, uh, for us, that problem uh, on both consumer and supply chain was kind of tamper resistance, right? Fraud proofs um, in, the, in the coupon space and uh, in the supply chain space. Um, and then I think, uh, you know, one of the challenges I see in, in education generally is that I think the industry is doing a pretty good job uh, in, in terms of, of making the tools um, and the knowledge available to technical practitioners, you know, like ourselves to advance these initiatives, but we're not doing a very good job of, of, of educating the public at large, I'll say, um, about about blockchain technology. We're sort, we've sort of relegated that to mainstream media. I don't think they're doing a very good job. Um, and so uh, anything we can do, um, maybe not at parties, but in terms of making ourselves available to talk, you know, more intelligently and, or, or help to improve the narrative, you know, kind of in the, in the you know, the wider, culturally in the wider community, I think it's going to make all of our jobs easier. Thanks. Guillaume. But thanks, uh, thanks a lot for giving me the, the chance to, to panel. Really appreciate. It. And um, yeah, you know, just to echo on what John was saying, uh, you know, the, the takeaway for me is that you know we're gonna go back in our community here in Southeast Asia in our monthly meetups in you know, all the meetings that we do, and basically try to share the vision of we want to get to a world where there is thousands of blockchain, tens of thousands of consortium, you know, and thousands of those shared computers running. If we want to build that, like was sharing we need a community of people uh, who know how to use a certain number of tools we know those open source software and uh, if we do all of that like peter was sharing was sharing you know we can then start to scale um, blockchain and i just want to finish with a simple example i have a friend who's got a factory um, and yesterday he called me and he said hey uh, i have this 3d drawing i'm gonna send it to a supplier i'm a bit worried they might take it and make a copy of it mm -hmm. can i do anything and I was on the phone with him and I told him, no, you can't. I mean, technically, yeah, there is, you know, uh, some uh, IRM solutions and you know, if you spend money, you're going to set it up. But practically, you cannot today, right now. And this is insane. Like when we have this technology now, like blockchain, where you can do very secure proof of ownership using tokens, uh, cryptographically secure methods of exchanging value, it, it, it's insane that uh, a big part of the traditional IT is still stuck in the, in the dark ages in a way. And so I think, you know, we need tools like Firefly to really scale uh, the technology like, like Peter was saying. So yeah, thanks again for having me. Thank you. Gary. Yeah, so first day I know this is, this has uh, been fun. Good to see everybody again and meet some, uh, some new faces. I guess my, uh, my deep thought for the day would be, um, I, I like in, you know, I did IOT like in like, I don't know, 2012, 2013, right? And there was a lot of hype around it, right? Like 25 billion devices and whatever, this huge curve, uh, very similar to actually blockchain and enterprise blockchain, if you think about it. And, and actually it had the same, you know, didn't quite take off as much as we might've thought at the time, right? Like there was just too much talk about the tech and all this other stuff. Now actually IoT is everywhere. We don't talk about it that much, but it's actually pervaded everybody's lives and it's used by major corporations. So to me, the success of, Blockchain, at least I'll say on the more enterprise sort of traditional distributed ledger side is when we stop talking about blockchain, that's when we have success, right? And I think that um, the way you do that is you, to the, to the points here, is you solve problems. Uh, so tools like Firefly, I think, go up, up above that level, right? You're actually solving a problem, showing people how they can solve a distributed industry problem, moving stuff around. Then you layer that on top of whatever the appropriate underlying technology is. But again, you started with the end, not the means, right? To, to date, a lot of people have been about the means and not the end. So I think that's why, you know, things like fire. That, that made sense in my head. I'm sure I love it. It makes sense if I play the recording back. But um, anyway, so that's why I think, you know, Firefly is well positioned uh, uh, in, uh, uh, here. So and it, uh, thanks for including me. Tony. 
Sure, thanks. This was awesome. Uh, really exciting thing to talk to y'all. Um, just amplifying one thing that John said, I would extend education to the business users as well. Um, I can tell you it's a challenge that we face every every day. And again, once they kind of understand it and they feel comfortable with it, they, they want to move forward. And then the second thing to amplify something that Gary said is, is accessibility. Um, one of the things that's critical for the in insurance industry is to be able to pull together all of the different channels and all the different data sources that are out there. And using tools like Firefly to actually make that easier and make that simpler and take a lot of the the, the worry and the administrative burden out of doing that um, really positions us and positions our industry for really uh, good continued success going forward. So thanks everybody. Sophia, bring us home. Yeah, well, we're coming out of the dark ages, to Kim's <laughs> point. Um, I, just a once in a generation shift as people are digitally transforming, moving to the cloud. We've got a set of technologies for the first time that goes all the way back into the system of record. Um, so it's, Really, it's really exciting times. I think you almost have said five years from now, we'll look back at this. So I hope all of us, eight of us get back on a panel in five years and we could, we could be reflecting. But th thanks so much for joining. It's um, been a pleasure with working, working with all of them in the industry all these years. Well, we'll catch, we'll, maybe we'll catch uh, Gary on his next deep thought of the day in five years time. <laughs> 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 I, I, I probably will have imploded by then, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you to all the panelists. It's been a lot of fun uh, quarterbacking this and lots of good uh, input and, and insight and wisdom. So we, I, I know everyone on this panel is, is wishing the, the Firefly community you know, a, a happy launch and a continued success. And so with, with these sorts of stakeholders and interested parties, we, we are very optimistic about that path ahead. Transitioning uh, to the agenda here, we've, we've just got one more hour of the launch day to go. Uh, we, we're gonna have a, a closing keynote and in parallel, there is a, a Meet the Community event going on. So there's two sessions to choose from. Sophia, is this, are we, Doing the, the keynote in this session, or do we need to move? I think we need to move. Let me double check. Um, just refreshing the screen here. Yeah, it's a separate separate session. Okay. So, so for everyone that's here, please join us for the last hour if you can. Uh, go over to the, the sessions, and, and you've got two great choices to choose from. <laughs> uh, a closing discussion and keynote. Uh, or a, a, a more open discussion with, with some of the maintainers and, and code committers in the community. So thanks again, everyone. Thank you. Take care, all. Have a good day.